Well, this is a genuinely weird experience. Uh, standing here, having a picture of me taken in front of a picture of me is just kind of strange. Um, there are several things that I like about this picture. A few that I don't, too. It's kind of a weird pose. But anyway, um, you know, I live in a little town, middle of nowhere in upstate New York. And yet, at the same time, I have this enormous privilege of being the lead scientist on an $800 million NASA mission to Mars. And uh, so I spend a lot of time on the telephone. I mean, I just spend hours and hours and hours. It's not, not uncommon for me to spend six or seven hours a day on the phone with people at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. And that's what I'm doing in this picture. If you look at my speakerphone, which is right there, the little red light is glowing, OK? <laughs> And that's because I'm on the phone, and I can't remember. I remember the picture being taken. They set the camera up on a tripod, and they, and they sort of ran out of the room so they'd be around the corner when it shot. So they're standing like right around the corner there. Um, and we were having a conference call, and I can, you can tell from the look on my face, something bad had happened. <laughs> Don't remember what it was, 2005, and they're still going, 10 year, still going five years later, so it couldn't have been too bad. But uh, this, was, this is just a very typical moment for me because I, I participate in this mission. I do most of it remotely. Um, and I have to you know, make my contributions from 2,500 miles away. And, and that's how I do it. Another thing that I like about this photo is that it's a panoramic image. The thing that's special to me about that is that what got me started in this business of Mars exploration in the first place was building a panoramic imager. There's an instrument on the rovers called PanCam that I first started working on in 1987, so 23 years ago, uh, to, uh, uh, and that eventually you know, became part of the payload for this rover and, and, and eventually did get to Mars. And this image is taken using a very similar technique where it takes individual frames and then sort of seams them together. And we take lots and lots of pictures just, just like this. The other thing that, that I ha in fact, I hadn't even thought about this until I saw this picture, was that uh, what got me started in the whole space of exploration business, I was an undergraduate student at Cornell. I went to school at Cornell. And in uh, 1977, I took a course. It was a graduate level course that was offered uh, at the time on the results of the Viking mission to Mars. I was a geologist at the time, and I was interested in geology, but somehow, you know, the geology of the Earth just wasn't grabbing me. You know, I hadn't found what I wanted to do. So I signed up for this course on the Viking mission to Mars. And uh, because it was a graduate level course, we were expected to write a term paper that was going to be some kind of piece of original research. And so two or three weeks in the semester, I figured, well, I better start thinking about my, my term paper. And so I got a key from the professor to a place called the Mars Room at Cornell. And it was, um, this of course before the internet and before CD-ROMs, all the, the, the images from the, the, from the Viking orbiters were distributed on these big rolls of photographic paper. And you would slice them up and put them into binders. And this Mars room was where the images were kept. And I'd never even seen a picture of Mars before. So I went over there, figured I'll flip through pictures for 15 or 20 minutes and try to come up with an idea for a term paper. I was in the room for four hours. And I walked out of that room knowing exactly what I wanted to do with the rest of my life. And that room was in this building right here. So there's, there's a lot of history in this for me. It was interesting to, to look at this and try to, it was 2005. 2005 was what I guessed. It was interesting to look at this picture and try to guess you know, exactly what year it was. Uh, there are some clues. You know, there are certain pictures of my daughters that are on the wall and then others that aren't yet because they haven't been taken. So that was a good clue. Uh, you know, which brand of laptop I had and how much gray there was not in my hair. <laughs> Actually, I think where the gray came from was too many conference calls like this. <laughs> Anyhow, those are just some reflections on, on the image. It's, uh, you know, it's a wonderful experience to be able to come here and, uh, and sort of be hanging in the same room with a few Nobel laureates and presidents and that sort of stuff. You know, that's kind of cool. So. Um, anyway, I appreciate the invitation uh, to be here and the chance to actually see this photo and, and, and to talk to you folks. Thank you so much for reflections. And Dr. Green, would you like to engage in a sure. conversation sure. about the science and So Jim, I hope you took note of what she said. I, I heard the words, shoestring budget. Oh, okay. Wow. This is the guy I get my money from at NASA headquarters. So. <laughs> and it was. You know, the two rovers that we have, the geologists on Mars, yeah. have really been uh, exciting. And it's just been wonderful that they've been able to survive. Yeah. And I'm sure that has surprised you. 
It has. Um, you know, I thought that we'd get, you know, I, I thought we were going to get six months, maybe even a year out of them. But seven years, uh, no, no, just no way. In fact, I can actually prove, you may not know this story, I can prove that we didn't expect them to last this long. So here's the thing. Inside the rovers, there's a, a, a device called a transponder. It's the, the radio, essentially, okay? And it used, it's used to communicate with Earth. And you can't change the station, okay? You can't vary the frequency. It's locked in. We built two flight transponders, and then we had two spares. A million dollars a piece, and they're sitting around on a shelf at JPL. So the next Mars mission, which is going to come 26 months after us, next Mars mission, Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, comes to us and says, hey, this is after we launched, can we have one of your spare transponders? We said, sure, take it. We're not going to be operating by the time you guys get to Mars. And now Spirit and MRO to Earth on the same frequency because of that. And it's a colossal pain in the neck because you've got to worry about, you know, this one's out of sight. Yeah, exactly. We never would have given them our spare transponder. So I can prove, I can prove that we didn't expect them to last more than 26 months. <laughs> well, what I like about this is indeed you have your kids here. Oh, yeah. And when you look out, you see that next generation. And, you know, and perhaps the next generation Mars explorers are in this room now. Yeah. So what would you say about their future in, in, in planetary science? You know, I, I honestly think I'm proud of the science that we've done. I'm proud of the discoveries that we've made. But I honestly think that the most important legacy of this mission could turn out to be the young people who saw this, saw us jumping up and down like we just won the Super Bowl when we landed it and all of that you stuff. Did. You did. And, and, and decide on the basis of that that they maybe want to pursue a career in engineering or technology or science. I mean, these rovers were built by people like me who grew up during the 60s watching Mercury and Gemini and Apollo on TV and dreaming of sending spaceships to Mars someday. And now we do. And the fondest hope that I've ever had for this mission is that there's going to be you know, young people who look at what we did, and they see the rovers and what they're doing. They'll think, wow, that's really cool. But you know, I bet I could do better. That would be the best thing, I think, that could come, possibly come out of the mission. I mean, water on Mars, yeah, that's good. OK, and I'm, I'm proud of that. But, but, but I, I, think, I think some of the other stuff may actually be more important. I agree with you completely. I mean, what's going on now in planetary science is really quite the renaissance. Yeah. We really have quite a few missions, and we have quite a few opportunities, and, and revolution in terms of our understanding the origin and evolution of, of our solar system, and how the planets are forming, how they have moved in time. Uh, well, Many I think of those concepts we have no idea about. You're right, but you know, I think maybe the best is still ahead of us. I do too. I mean, we've still we haven't brought rocks back from Mars yet. We haven't discovered life anywhere yet, and a lot of people think that we're going to someday. That's right. Um, you know, there's maybe an ocean on Europa, one of the moons of Jupiter. There's, there's so much out there, and I just feel like the most exciting missions are the ones that, that are still ahead of us. So, yeah, but if this can help get people interested in, in you know, not, not everybody's going to grow up and be an astronaut or grow up and, and work on a mission to Mars, but they might choose to go into a technical career, into a scientific career that could lead to you know, basic medical research, that could lead to new technological breakthroughs, throughs, new consumer products. I mean, all kinds of things that the country and the world need. And uh, you know, people get inspired to go into careers like this, and then they can just go in any direction that they want. And if we can help to make that happen. Yeah, that's a really good point, because it's not just the science. The engineering and putting the rovers together, how they would operate, how they would receive their power, how, how you know, they have to survive overnight, they have to survive over the winter. Yeah. All those engineering challenges in another world is it, really uh, quite astounding. Yeah. We've been able to overcome that. And that takes a whole cadre of engineers to do that. I, you know, I wrote a book about the project, and in an appendix of the book, I tried to list the names of all the people, at least up to that point, who had worked on the mission. And there are more than 4,000. Names. That, that that's the book. Yeah, that's the, that's the book. That's the, the the draft dust jacket that my publisher had just sent me. That that helped me to date the image. But uh, yeah, there are more than four thousand names yeah. on that list, and uh, it's it's actually it's all kinds of people too. It's you know it's uh, it's scientists and it's engineers, but it's also 
security guards who watched the rover as it was being shipped across the country and lawyers and accountants. I mean, we were spending a million bucks a day. We needed a lot of lawyers and accountants. <laughs> <laughs> um, I keep coming back to the money thing, don't I? I don't know. Maybe it's because Jim's here. Well, the um, money, of course, is what we get from the public. Yeah. It's really, you know, we are uh, on the hook. We are accountable oh, yeah. to provide uh, a well-run planetary program and get the most out of the investment we have. Yeah. Now, granted, we invest in technology, 99.99% of all the money we invest is always here, to in our people and everything else. But um, it is a fabulous opportunity to do something incredibly important for the nation. I always felt that one of our most important responsibilities was conveying the results of our mission to the public. I mean, NASA, NASA does a lot of wonderful things. NASA does cosmology. They do gamma ray spectroscopy. You know, try explaining gamma ray spectroscopy to a second grader. It's hard, OK? <laughs> but this, it's a robot. It's looking at rocks. It's not that complicated, OK? And so what I felt was the, the, the almost unique accessibility of this mission compared to a lot of other things that go on gave us not just a special opportunity, but a special responsibility to communicate our results to the public. Because something like this is going to attract attention that is disproportionate to the magnitude of its budget. It just gets a lot of attention. And you can use that in a productive way. You can use it to tell a story about how science really works. I remember. During some of the early press briefings, you know, the way, here's how NASA press conferences usually work. The way they usually work is some discovery has been made, and it's been sent to a journal, it's been peer reviewed, and it's about to be published, and then they get a bunch of experts, and they sit all in a row, and they go from left to right, and everybody talks about the discovery that was just made. In our case, we landed, and they wanted a press conference that day, when we just seen the pictures an hour ago. And then they want one the next day, and the next day, and the next day. And People had to get comfortable with the idea of a bunch of NASA scientists standing up and saying, we don't know what's going on. <laughs> we're confused. And, and uh, initially, initially, some people were a little uncomfortable with that, with us sure. getting up there and saying, we're confused. But the thing that I realized was that it was a chance to show people how science really works. A lot of people think of science as being this static body of knowledge that you read from a textbook or maybe you read about in a NASA press release once it's all been discovered. And science isn't like that. Science is this joyful process of exploration and discovery. And you get something new every day. And so we could get up there, and we could get up to press briefing and say, there's all these weird little round things in the soil. We don't know what they are. Here's some ideas, multiple working hypotheses, right? Here's some ideas for what they might be. And we're going to drive over there. And we're going to try something out that'll maybe tell us if our idea is right. Testing hypothesis. OK? Come back tomorrow. <laughs> Tune in tomorrow, and, and, and we'll have something new for you. And it was a chance for people to share in that process of exploration and discovery. Um, and you know, this has continued to go on. I mean, we still get an enormous number of hits on our website. There are tens of thousands of people worldwide. I mean, we know this from looking at our web traffic who get up and they make their tea and they get their cornflakes and they turn on their computer and they hit the website to see what happened on Mars yesterday. And you know, there, there are, you can go back through the history of exploration and it used to be that explorers would sail off over the horizon and maybe come back a year or two or three years later with wonderful tales to tell, but everybody back home had to kind of wait for them to get back. The beautiful thing about this is we can actually take everybody along with us. And I mean, I'll tell you, this, this is a, a, a dirty little secret. There's a, there's a community worldwide of amateur scientists who download our images and process them. And they have websites where they put all these things up. And the funny part of it is some of them are in Europe. Okay, now I'm on the East Coast of the United States. My colleagues on the mission are out on the West Coast. So these guys in Europe frequently see these pictures long before I do. And three hours you know, later, the, the folks at JPL see them. So what I'll do is I'll get up, and I'll make my cup of tea and get my cornflakes, and I'll flip open my laptop, and I'll go to the website that these guys run. And they've already taken the images, made color composites, made mosaics, made panoramas. And you know the, nobody's going to be awake at JPL for another three hours, and I've already got the panoramas in front of me, because they, you know, we got amateurs processing the images over in Holland. <laughs> it's great. And that's because JPL has an operations team. 
that lives on Mars time. Yo. So what's the difference between Earth time and Mars time? Because that's another dedicated group of people that are behind the scenes moving that rover. That was an interesting experience. Yeah, for the first uh, four months after we landed, everybody on the project team, the scientists, the engineers, everybody, all lived on Martian time. Now, they, the, the Martian day is not 24 hours long. It's 24 hours and 39 minutes long. You might think it would be cool to be able to sleep in an extra 39 minutes each day. Mm, it's not. So the way, I mean, the way this worked is, let, let's say our daily operations planning meeting is at noon today. Then tomorrow it's at 12.39. And the day after that it's at 1.18. And it marches around and two and a half weeks later it's in the middle of the night. Okay, and then I've got two rovers on Mars, so I got to take my science team and split it in half. So I got two different teams, all of them living on Mars time, but in two different Martian time zones. Okay, and if you're working on ro one rover and you want to switch to the other, you get Martian jet lag. I mean, the, 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 the two landing sites were on opposite sides of the planet. They're 12 hours apart. If you wanted to switch rovers, it was like getting on a plane and going to India. You had to switch your schedule around 12 hours. So, yeah, that was, that was a kind of weird experience. Um, I mean, we, we had, um, in our operations area, we had blackout curtains on all the windows so that you couldn't, you know, tell whether it was daytime or nighttime outside. All the clocks were on Mars time. There were no Earth time clocks. It was like working in a casino. You can't tell if it was daytime or nighttime outside. Um, you know, we had, we had blackout curtains in our apartments. We had Mars time watches. Um, somebody went to Walmart and bought a whole bunch of clock radios and then hacked the electronics so that they would run on Mars time. So I had a Mars time alarm clock in my apartment. We have smart people. They can do stuff like that. Um, yeah, the, the, whole, the whole Mars time thing was a, was a, was a very strange experience. And a fabulous group. I mean, these people are really dedicated. That, that really is. All on some heroes. Yeah. yeah. All on some Yeah. Uh, you know, there ought to be 4,000. If you really care about this mission, there ought to be 4,000 pictures in the North National Portrait Gallery because there are 4,000 people who worked, right. worked on this. Um, you know, and, and I think the thing, the thing that unites this team more than anything else is just a passion for what we do. It is so much fun to do what we do. You know? <laughs> it is just so much. Despite the look on this guy's face, he's having fun. He's having fun. So. Well, thanks very yeah, much, thank you, Jim. It was wonderful. Would you be willing to take questions? Sure, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. We can do better than this on Mars. Yeah. The, the, the thing that struck me, I was working with the Viking orbiter images. The pictures taken from orbit show the entire planet. And, you know, I was a fledgling terrestrial geologist. And uh, I saw stuff that I recognized. Um, when I was, the summer between when I was a senior in high school, my freshman year at Cornell, um, I spent some time on a glacial geology expedition in northwestern British Columbia and, and southeast Alaska. And I saw features there called rock glaciers, which are formed when you have ice and rock mixed together and it can flow. And I saw stuff on those pictures of Mars that looked just like that. I saw, you know, dendritic valley systems that had to have been carved by liquid water. And so you've got this place that's just cold and dry and desolate today, but it's got these clues that in the past it really was different. And that intrigued me, but it was the, it was the it was the Earth-like, it was the ancient Earth-like features that really caught my eye. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm sure this depends on the time of the year and how much energy you get from the sun. But in general, how far can one travel in a day? Ah, okay. How far you can travel a day? You're right. It depends on how much power that you have. Uh, it depends very sensitively on how difficult the terrain is. Um, our all-time record, all-time best, we'll probably never top this. Uh, there was one drive, we did 204 meters in one day with Opportunity. I felt pretty good about that one. Um, these days, Opportunity is routinely doing 100 meters a day, which is, which is really good. Spirit, I think Spirit's all-time record is 125. In fact, there was a stretch, this was fun, there was a stretch of time when Opportunity was trying to get from Eagle Crater to Endurance Crater, 
and Spirit was trying to get from Bonneville Crater to the Columbia Hills, and we were basically having rover drag races where the teams were competing <laughs> to see, because all we were trying to do was drive, both of them, and we were just competing to see who could cover the most mileage in a day. Um, after, Spirit, after Spirit broke the right front wheel, you know, a good day was five or 10 meters. So it really depends. The Spirit landing site is much tougher for driving than the Opportunity landing site, and so Opportunity's got like 24 kilometers on the odometer now, whereas Spirit's got about seven. So when you upload the commands for that day to drive, it goes like this. Yeah, pedal to the metal. I mean, at, you apply full voltage to all the motors. No, it's faster than that. It's faster than that, Jim. When, <laughs> pedal to the metal, full voltage to all the wheels, you get six centimeters a second. So, pretty slow, yeah. But is there anything that you would want to do at night that you couldn't do during the day? The, there are, yeah. There are some science objectives that are specifically enabled by, by working at night. Uh, there are processes that only work at night, like condensation of frost on rocks and on rover surfaces. And there are things, I mean, we've learned this by taking pictures of our solar arrays at night, and you can see, uh, you can see frost deposits. Um, there are science that you can do by looking at the Martian sky at night by looking at the, you know, you have, you have stars of a known brightness and you can look at how bright they look and figure out how much, you know, condensates there are in the atmosphere at that particular time of night and so forth. So yeah, there is science that is specifically enabled at night. We have done some nighttime science uh, with our rovers because during the summertime, there's enough power during the day to fully charge the batteries and so you've got those, those batteries charged at night and you can use them to wake up during the night and do things. Yeah. Uh, I am a team member for a couple of the instruments. One is called the Alpha Particle X-ray Spectrometer, which measures the chemistry of elements, uh, the elemental chemistry of rocks on the surface. Uh, one is called SAM, which is probably the most complicated instrument on the rover. It lives inside the rover, and it does very detailed analyses of organic molecules. Now, having said that, I will tell you that if you talk to the principal investigators, the lead scientists, for either one of those instruments and said that I was working on those instruments, they would laugh at you. Okay, it's all they can do to get me to show up for an occasional team meeting because I'm too busy with the other rovers. So I, I haven't had the time for MSL that I would have liked and that I expected to at this point because there's these two other rovers that I care about. Yeah, but you also bring such a unique uh, set, set of experiences with you. And it's a matter of time yeah. uh, that you'll be more and more involved. And they know that. Uh, I'm going to be the last guy to turn out the lights when the last Mer rover dies. Okay, I started on this in 1987. I'm seeing it through. I don't care what that other rover can do. 